environment. Uh, we need to be aware of our neighbours. We need to monitor things. Um, there's still some really bad sources of confusion. So this is running on a virtual server. Um, I bring, bring up um, computer properties within Windows. It will still tell me I'm running on this CPU core at this speed with this amount of memory. Okay, that is factually true, but there are so many configuration options between that CPU and this edition of this instance of Windows that it may be far from the truth and really send you down the wrong direction. If you really think that you've got a 3.1 gig CPU that's running your code, you know, that 3.1 gig could be shared with 20 other users. The reason that this data gets exposed um, is there are some hardware calls that Windows can make the hypervisors pass straight down to the hardware. The problem that Microsoft had um, was if they were to return a synthetic value, what should that be? Because it might be some application software actually don't look for a specific CPU type. Um, if you're running the same hypervisor in 10 years' time, should it still return back the same synthetic CPU type? So that Microsoft's decision, um, I'm not sure if it was the same as VMware's, was they will always re reply back whatever the hardware gives. So some hardware calls past the hypervisor, um, as we just mentioned, and also SQL Server wait stats. <coughs> so you will still see the same wait stat errors, um, errors, counts that you were used to see. Um, so page IO latch, SO schedule yield. Even in the virtual environment, though, there's still only symptoms rather than causes. So these are typically two that you will see on any poor performing instance of SQL Server. Can anyone tell me what the two issues are with that? Problems on CPU starvation. Yeah. Someone's um, uh, IO subsystem. Yeah, physical IO. So page IO actually is saying that there's, there have been a very high or there has been an instance of SQL Server waiting for data to be read from this. Um, an SOS schedule yield tends to be CPU pressure. So monitoring has to change. Um, one of the problems that we have to change our stance to monitoring is that Windows doesn't know the truth anymore. So when you fire up CPU uh, task manager and watch the CPU utilization, what is 100%? You know, 100% of is, is always a valid number, but it's 100% of what? And that what Windows never actually knew anyway, and that what can be very, very different to what we're expecting. Um, the same with memory. There are very different and clever tricks that hypervisors can do to make you think you've got more memory that you can access, that more memory that you um, recently accessed that you can't access anymore, or actually you've got a lot more memory that is available to you, but you just can't ask to use it so you don't know you've got it. So this is really the challenge that you've got. Your approach to monitoring this will vary. Um, and an example, just so you can kind of see the challenge that you have, um, this is taken within a virtual machine. So I ran CPU stress or one of those tools. Uh, this was a virtual machine maxed out CPU-wise. Um, if I looked at the equivalent counter within the Hyper-V hosts monitor, um, it was telling me that that virtual machine was only using 40% of a physical core. Um, yet I could be the SQL DBA, I jump on the server in a hurry, I fire up Task Manager and I see 100%. What this shows me is that this server instance or this operating system at the moment is using 100% of the CPU resource available to it. So it's valid in a logical sense. I can say that every bit of CPU resource this instance had, it was using. But I have no idea how much it had. The reason that 40% was in place was because at the Hyper-V hypervisor level, I put a 40% max threshold on the amount of CPU this virtual machine could use. So I could be the DBA monitoring the server and thinking it's using 100% CPU utilization. Why? Well, actually, 100% was only 40% of what you would normally have available to you. Right, wrong, indifferent. There is no answer to that question. You just need to be aware if you're the type of person that needs to monitor these environments that you need to get your data from the right source. Um, in my last session, it's the last SQL bits. Um, was all about monitoring virtualized SQL Server instances. So we mentioned memory. SQL Server um, loves memory. Windows uh, likes to give memory to SQL Server as much as it can. 
hypervise us though and provide to give us little memory as they can. So in a physical server, in the virtualization world, memory is the most precious resource. Um, I can't do anything clever as a hypervisor to make memory do more than one thing at a time. Ultimately, a uh, bit in uh, a memory chip can only store one bit. I can't compress it, I can't... You know, there is a finite amount that you can do with memory to make it go further. So hypervisors now use what I call demand-based memory allocation. So what this basically says is, I've got a physical server, it's got loads of physical memory in it, um, all of the virtual machines, they need different amounts of memory at different times. So they can have as much memory as they want, when they want it, um, as long as it's free to be available. And that's great, because if I've got 20 web servers, um, I don't want to have all 20 boot up with 4 gig of memory, have 80 gig of memory sat there assigned, but only have um, 16 gig deployed across all 20, because they, they haven't started doing anything yet. What I may then find is that one web server gets really, really busy, and I do want that one to have more memory than all the others. And that's where this demand-based memory allocation will recognize um, a low memory condition within a specific virtual machine. It will say, well, that virtual machine would benefit from having more memory. I've got more memory I can give it, so I'll give it to it. you have a question, Mark? Can it do the same trick with the processor? So processors, it's always doing that. Um, it time slices and it's, it's a lot more dynamic and real time in how it allocates. Apart from when you hard allocate it in the hypervisor. Yes. So the idea is, um, and I think I've got a breath of <coughs> it, that's my only animation rather. Um, the idea is that, yeah, you can move memory between virtual machines based on demand. Uh, in Windows, you will see this in the Hyper-V world um, as your amount of physical memory increasing. So, um, VMware uses a slightly different model, uh, but Hyper-V, which SQL Server is more natively aligned to, uh, will tell Windows you've now got more physical memory, you've got a bit more physical memory, and that comes from that hot hot memory feature that we saw earlier. So Hyper-V will recognise, as we'll see in a moment, low memory, and it will physically assign more of it. However, we've given all this memory away, there might be a time when you need to get it back there might be um, more important virtual machines that need more memory than another virtual machine. Um, and this is where things like weighting and prioritization come into place. So you can say, if there's ever a fight for memory, these two virtual machines always win. Um, and if you're not one of those two virtual machines, you want to know that you're not, because otherwise you'll wonder why you always run slow and you make next to you always runs fast. Um, how the hypervisors get their memory back differs again significantly between VMware and Hyper-V, uh, but essentially they have clever ways of, of getting memory back so that they can give it to other virtual machines. The big difference uh, though that you will see um, is that your physical memory value in Windows never ever goes down. It will go up, but it will never go down. That's a rule within Windows. So if you are using dynamic memory in Hyper-V, you will see it go up. If it starts to go down, well it can't go down, that doesn't mean the same memory isn't being taken away from you. If the machine restarts, does it revert to the originally assigned value? Or? It does. Okay. Yeah. So, one of the things to be aware of, if you fire up um, Task Manager, Task Manager thinking it's got 16 gig of memory available, um, it might not, it might have had, but it might not have 16 gig now available to it. Um, and it's beyond the scope of this presentation to say, going to how it gets taken away and how you detect it, but it's something to be aware of. If you're suddenly getting memory pressure within SQL Server or um, SSRS and you're on a virtual machine, you may not have the amount of memory that you think you've got right now. So, the most detailed slide of the evening, um, a bit of technical internals overview of how um, Hyper-V works within that this dynamic memory functionality works in Windows uh, Azure and 8. So dynamic memory is the feature that allows um, virtual servers to be allocated more memory when they need it. Uh, Hyper-V has a driver that runs inside the virtual machine. When Windows detects a very low amount of available free megabytes, um, it will go back to Hyper-V and report a low memory condition. If the physical memory is available to be assigned to it, um, it will get more physical memory assigned to the virtual server, um, and that's done in the dynamic memory setting. 
There's an API within Windows called the Enlightened Memory Edition. Um, it's a lightweight version of hot memory that's designed for the virtual world. So you can actually say you've got more physical memory. You can now start having heads and nets applications. The inverse um, is a ballooning driver. If you're not familiar with that term, but you are using virtual servers, you need to Google that heavily because the ballooning driver is how your virtual machine gets memory taken away from it. Um, so SQL Server 2008, or I think both versions, um, Enterprise Edition only, um, hooks in really nicely to dynamic memory. So, so far in this slide, um, the Windows operating system has reported low memory, Hyper-V has assigned it more physical memory, Windows has added that extra physical memory to the virtual machine, SQL Server then notices there is more memory that can be used. So, if you are running SQL Server um, on a virtual server with um, Hyper-V and dynamic memory, it will detect that and it will enable hot app memory support within SQL Server by default. Um, in the 64-bit world, you can't choose to enable it manually. It's only an auto-detect and enable feature. In SQL Server 2012, this is a major change for the virtualization support guys in the product team. Um, they now support this feature in standard edition. So if you run SQL Server 2012 um, on Hyper-V, you will get this hot app memory support in standard edition, whereas before it was exclusively uh, enterprise edition. So SQL Server, when it starts with um, the hot app memory support detected, it will give itself a um, virtual address space to be 16 times the amount of memory it had on startup. So what that basically says is that I can give the amount of memory that SQL Server has access to um, an increase of 16 times and SQL Server will have enough memory address space already reserved available to use it as that memory becomes available. Um, you can't measure that, you can't monitor that, that's an internal behaviour. Um, I know that because the SQL program team now think it's a great idea to be able to expose that because you can actually, um, if you could query the fact that these two things happen on startup, it would be a great troubleshooting um, feature to be able to detect inspiration with dynamic memory. But at the moment, these two options, they're all internal only um, variables that can't be exposed. So we have a very large virtual address space which can use this extra memory that gets hot at, hot at it. Um, and the buffer pool is then increased to use that extra physical memory. The size of the buffer pool, as we probably know, can never be greater than the amount of physical memory that we have. Um, and <coughs> can anyone tell me a big difference in the memory management between six seven two thousand eight and two thousand twelve. Well, two thousand twelve was a single memory allocator. Yeah. So this goes back to previous the thirty two bit world. So we used to have the buffer pool, and then we used to have all the other memory that SQL Server needed to use, um, and we could never configure that other size. <coughs> um, so even when we set max server memory, that's only setting the maximum size of the buffer pool. SQL Server could still use a couple of gig on top of that. Um, in SQL Server 2012, the max server memory setting now sets the limit on every bit of memory SQL Server uses. So there is no ambiguity about it could <coughs> use this amount. Um, so that's certainly something, again, that we integrate better into the virtual environment by being able to set a def definitive max server memory size. Um, SQL Cat have a white paper on how to use SQL Server with dynamic memory optimally. Um, really, really good white paper if that's something that So, breezing on through storage, um, do ask me any questions at the end, because I'm conscious that I've got nine minutes. Uh, do I? Uh, uh, <coughs> about eight or nine, maybe? Yes, sorry. I yes. don't, I mean, people start leaving, so just That's keep going. Cool. So, I'd rather get to the slides and then ask questions, then, then I'll spoil anyone who's expecting an exciting slide. Um, so storage design is another area that we need to be really, really conscious of when we work in the virtual environment with SQL Server. Um, so even in the physical world, SQL Server loves having multiple isolated, uncontended pots of storage to do different things with. You know, we all know it's second nature that transaction logs on different disks to data. Uh, it's amazing though when you go to the virtual environment, people put them all together back into one big piece of disk. Um, so as a general piece of advice, uh, for those of you that, that 
get involved in this, those of you that might have to ask your sysadmin uh, 